You may ask me where I'm headed, you may ask me where I'm bound. Well, I'm going to a country across the sea, and I know I'll have a mansion, and I know I'll have a crown. Well, I'm bound for the kingdom of the free. I'm bound for the kingdom of the blessed and the free. And my Jesus soon is coming after me. There is nothing to compare with the glory over there. Yes, I'm bound for the kingdom of the free. Well, I'm going to a country where they say we'll never die. We'll be endless joy and glory there for me. Yes, I know I'll live forever in that city by and by. Well, I'm bound for the kingdom of the free. Yes, I'm bound for the kingdom of the blessed and the free. And my Jesus soon is coming after me. After me. There is nothing to compare. Yes, I'm bound for the kingdom of the free. Yes, I'm bound for the kingdom of the free. The Bible tells us that when a man and a woman are joined together in marriage, that the two become one. And we understand that this union can have great potential for good, or it can also have a very uh, disastrous potential for evil. In our study today, we want to find some principles which are sound principles on which we can build solid homes. And we can even find warnings of tendencies that can ruin our homes and our lives. Ananias and his wife Sapphira present us with a warning about coveting earthly wealth. They also teach us that we cannot fool the Holy Spirit. It is impossible for us to lie to God because God always knows the truth. We want to read from the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 32, down through chapter 5 and verse 11. Now, the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things that he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there any among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each one as they had need. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. But a certain man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a possession and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. 
But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. Now, it was about three hours later when his wife, Sapphira, without knowing what had happened, came in, and Peter answered her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. We can understand why great fear might have come upon the church and those who heard about these things. It's interesting that Ananias had died and it was three hours later when Sapphira comes in. She didn't even know about his death as yet. Uh, she was asked the same question about the property that they had sold. You know, the beginning of the early church is described in these verses that we've read and we find that they were a benevolent community, but we also notice that this was based upon free will giving. As Peter told Ananias, as long as the property was, it, was your own, it was yours to do with as you saw fit. He wasn't condemned for not giving all of the money to the apostles or to the church. He was condemned for holding back a part of it and then lying and pretending that he had given all of it. That was his sin. So the early church, while they had things in common, and my idea, and this is just my opinion, but I think many of those who came to Jerusalem and heard the gospel that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost obeyed the gospel, and we know many of them were from distant lands. I believe that they were feeling that the Lord was coming again very soon. And many of them sold out back home where they lived and moved into Jerusalem. And we know that <laughs> buying and selling property can take a while, especially it could have in those days. And uh, people may have found themselves in need of some things until their property sold and they had what they needed. And so... The early church, I think, was helping one another in these ways. It was not something that was demanded of them. And it was not, you know, uh, a, a, an instance where the apostles said, now you've got to give all of your money to the church or you've got to do this or that. As long as the property was theirs, it was theirs to dispose of as they saw fit. But because of the situation, I think, and the needs there in the church, Many of them were contributing heavily so that uh, those who had need could be taken care of. So it was a benevolent community based upon free will giving. In Acts 2, uh, verses 44 through 47, we read, Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all, as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. We're not told if Ananias and Sapphira were natives of Jerusalem or not. 
It could have been that they were some of those or among those who obeyed the gospel that had come from a distant land and from other places. And so they may have been among some who decided to remain in Jerusalem. And uh, they sold the property that they had. We don't know anything about the rest of their family. We don't know if they had children, anything else about the rest of their family. Just all we know is about Ananias and Sapphira. We do know that they had obeyed the gospel and that they were a part of the family of God. And we do know that they enjoyed all the blessings that the rest of the church was enjoying together at that time. And so they were a part of this family, this community of Christians. And uh, they were a part of a very caring family uh, that cared about one another and was trying to take care of one another. Well, these then were their circumstances, but what about their deed? Their condemnation, of course, was for lying to the Holy Spirit. But what caused them to tell such a lie? Why would they lie and attempt to lie to the Holy Spirit? Greed, of course, may have been the underlying cause. They wanted to keep apart for themselves uh, from the property that they had sold. And Peter did not condemn them. Again, we point this out. He did not condemn them for wanting to keep a part of their belongings and their possessions. He makes it plain that they could have done just as they pleased with their money and with their property. Their desire to keep their material possessions led them, though, to become pretenders before others. They put on a false face and hid behind a lie. We could probably say that pride also played a part in this masquerade of theirs. They wanted everyone to think that they were doing just like Barnabas and others had done, selling their property and giving it to the church and for the care of those who were in need. But deep within their hearts, they really didn't want to make that kind of sacrifice. So they wanted it to appear that they were making that kind of sacrifice, but in reality, that was not really in their heart. And so they conceive evidently together to tell a lie to the Holy Spirit, to lie about the money that they were getting uh, for this property that they sell. Peter points out that they were not acting at the prompting of the Holy Spirit in this deed, in this lying, but they were directed by the evil counsel of Satan himself. It was Satan that put this lie into their hearts and caused them to decide to lie to Peter and to the Holy Spirit. And of course, we know the results were immediate for both of them. Both Ananias and Sapphira lost their lives in the very hour that they lied to the Holy Spirit. And of course, that was a very heavy price for them to pay for their duplicity. But what lessons can we learn from Ananias and Sapphira? This is a very short story, just a few verses, about 11 verses in Acts chapter 5. You know, what changes would we make in our lives if every sin were immediately rewarded? When Ananias lied, he fell down dead. When Sapphira lied, she fell down dead. If all of our sins were immediately rewarded, we might feel like it was the same as touching a hot stove. We would withdraw our hands immediately. <laughs> we would not go there if we felt we were going to get an immediate reward for all of our sinful behavior. And we know the Bible says twice in this narrative that fear came upon many of those who heard these things. Well, it is evident, isn't it, that the same fear should come 
upon us. It should instill in us a desire to avoid these kinds of actions. Even today, even all these many years removed from the fate of Ananias and Sapphira, it should also prompt us to want to tell the truth and to want to be honest, and it should prompt us to want to have honest hearts before God. Because we must certainly know that God knows our hearts. We cannot lie to Him. And the Bible tells us this time and time again, like in Psalms 44 and verse 21. Shall not God search out for he knows the secrets of our hearts. So God knows our hearts. And we may be able to fool others. In fact, we may be great pretenders. But the Lord is never fooled by our charades. Because God knows our hearts. So in attempting to keep back a little portion of material wealth, Ananias and Sapphira lost every bit of it. They lost it all. Their story reminds us of the rich fool that we read about in the book of Luke, who tried to keep all of his material possessions for his own use. Remember, he had a great crop. He built bigger barns to bestow and put all of his goods up. And, uh, of course, all of these things were less than useless for him because that very night his life was required of him and again in this in this instance this man was not condemned for being rich and he was not condemned for having a bumper crop he was not condemned for building bigger barns in which to bestow his goods but his condemnation came because he said to himself, So you have many goods laid up for many years. Eat, drink, and be merry. <laughs> you know, just keep it all for yourself. In fact, the Bible says that he was not rich toward God. And that was his condemnation. And God knew his heart as well. And so God knows our hearts. And Ananias and Sapphira serve as a warning to us not to place too much importance upon material possessions. We know that these things are all passing the way. Again, the Bible tells us that time and time again, but it seems to be a very hard lesson for us to learn that we ought to not trust in the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. And Ananias and Sapphira further remind us that we cannot lie to God. God knows our hearts, and it is impossible. It's impossible for God himself to lie, and it is impossible for us to lie to God. He sees through all of our pretense and all of our uh, charades that we may put before others. Others may not see it. We may be able to fool other people, but we cannot fool God. And so Ananias and Sapphira, as a couple, as a married couple, serve as a warning to us today not to trust in material things and to remember that God knows our hearts and that we cannot lie to God. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you that you know us and you know our hearts and yet you love us. Even when we have been unfaithful, even when we have sinned, we know that when we turn to you in repentance that you hear us and that you forgive. And we're so thankful, Father, for that. And we pray that we will always try to have honest hearts before you that when we sin, we will repent of our sin and we will turn to you for the forgiveness that you have promised that you will offer to us and that you will give. And we are thankful, Father, for this great truth from your word that you do forgive sin 
and that you want us to come to you and ask for forgiveness. And so we pray that we would not be guilty of trying to lie to you or to your spirit, trying to hide things that we would not be caught up in things here upon the earth and and try to put on a pretense before others and things that are not really true about our hearts. Father, help us not to be self-deceived in that way, but help us to be honest, honest with others and honest with you. And Father, when we do sin, help us to turn to you for the forgiveness that you have promised us. And help us, Father, to live honest lives before you, that our hearts may be open before you, and that you will hear our hearts, Father, for we want to love you more, and we want to live as you want us to live and as we should live. So hear our heart's desire to follow you, and forgive us, Father, when we fall short of that as we turn to you for forgiveness. In the name of Jesus, we confidently pray. Amen. Well, we pray that the Lord is blessing you and that you are doing well. And we just pray that you'll continue to be the light and the salt that the Lord wants you to be in the community where you live and that you will be a, a light drawing lost men to the Savior. Until we see you again, may God bless and keep you. Keep me from sin, O Lord, guide me each day. Thy word, my counsel, be always I pray. Ere let my love for Thee grow strong and fervently. Safely watch over me. Always I pray, keep me from sin, O oh Lord, until at last I stand before thy throne, sure and steadfast. Then I can say through thee, I've won the victory. From sin you've kept me free, life's cares have passed. Keep me from sin, O oh Lord, close to thy side. When trials come, O oh Lord, with me abide. As thou hast done before, knock gently at my door. Enter forevermore, tis open wide. Keep me from sin, O oh Lord, until I last I stand before thy throne sure and steadfast then I can say through thee I won the victory from sin you've kept me free life's cares have passed keep me from sin O oh Lord the tempter strong when Satan's ways unfold, keep me from wrong. Watch o'er me day by day, lest I should go astray. Keep thou my soul, I pray, faithful and strong. Keep me from sin, O Lord, until at last I stand before thy throne. Sure and steadfast, then I can say through thee, I've won the victory. From sin you've kept me free, life's cares have passed.